Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan, and welcome back to the unconscionable and deplorable Comic Vault. This is a You Made Me Read, and this time you made me read the Punisher Max Slavers arc from 2005, or at least it started in 2005. This is written, of course, by Garth Ennis, with art by Leandro Fernandez. Uh, this is a really difficult read, and it's going to be a tough thing to talk about. Uh, let me right up front say that uh, this is not uh, conventionally entertaining. This is a thing that is all about um, kind of like raising awareness of a real horrifying, despicable thing that happens in real life, and I, uh, it's a, it's, and, and I don't, I don't want to make it sound like a PSA or anything, there is a really wonderfully well-told story here, it's very literary, it's very character-driven, it's, um, very tightly woven, uh, this is Ennis at the absolute top of his game, I think, um, but this is not a fun thing to read, uh, there's a little bit of kind of black levity here and there, uh, but it's gonna be one of the hardest things I've probably ever had to sit down and try to discuss. This was requested by, uh, Chewbacca's lover, who, uh, and thanks very much to you, who had me do the Up is Down, Black is White arc last time. Uh, I, I believe, um, I did something for him, and, or maybe a couple times ago. He's not having me go through all of Punisher Max, even though these two stories happen to be back-to-back, -back, uh, which is astounding to me and quite an achievement, because I thought that that was uh, a really thought-provoking and well-told story as well. Uh, it seems like Ennis is uh, kind of running the gamut on revenge thriller, where he's uh, kind of dissecting the notion of revenge, different kinds of revenge, uh, the various aspects of that notion. Uh, so human condition, where does that come from? Why are people vengeful? Uh, why does the Punisher of course, go after the people that he goes after. It's not always as personal as it was in Up is Down, as in Black is White. Um, in for various missions the Punisher will go on, uh, there will be different reasons, of different motivations for his revenge, even though he operates the same way every time, and in his mind, evil is evil, and he is just there to punish the bad guys, and that's it. Uh, this story is all about, instead of being uh, personal in the same way it was last time for the Punisher, where you had, and we're gonna have to talk about some very, you know, R-rated, heavy, rough stuff today, of course. Uh, last arc, you had in a mob boss, a very kind of typical conventional mob boss, uh, who wanted to try to take down the Punisher by hitting him where he lives, who defecated on his family's grave, and the Punisher went after him and murdered everyone connected to him because it did indeed hit him where he lives. This is about the Punisher going after people who are doing things that don't have anything to do with him, but are so despicable and, I uh, like, bother him so much that, like, you simultaneously see the what compassion and what soul is left in Frank Castle, while simultaneously you're also seeing the blackest part of him. And he is, uh, in, in this, going after... The, the, just one of the one of the scariest and most messed up things I've ever read in anything. Uh, he he stumbles upon a sex slave ring, uh, thus the slaver's title. And by the way, I'm not going to show any art today uh, beyond covers, uh, partly because I don't even know what from this I can get away with showing. Um, sometimes in the past with uh, Rated R stuff, I have just drawn, or, or mature stuff in comics, I guess, I've drawn the line really just at nudity. Uh, if I'm showing if I'm showing really graphic violence, I won't keep it on the screen for too long, uh, but like language and stuff I don't usually worry about. Lately, YouTube has been uh, kind of cracking down more and more on that kind of stuff, and it's hard to know what I can even get away with posting without getting flagged or um, without being able to monetize and stuff, so I've decided that uh, I'm just not going to actually show interiors this time. 
Um, but I also want to do that because I think everybody should experience this for themselves. And I'm probably going to spoil a little bit today like I usually do with the vault. Uh, but I might speak a little bit more generalized just because uh, I don't want to take away from a personal experience you might have with this if you've never sat down and read it. Uh, I think it is, um, I, th I think it's a really important piece, and uh, I think some of the things that it reveals about this, uh, like, sex slave culture that really does happen in real life is uh, important to get in front of people. And even though this came out back in uh, 05 and it's been 15, 16 years since then, um, this I'm sure this stuff still happens and is just as bad or worse than it ever was. Um, so the idea here is uh, it's, it's a very different kind of criminal organization uh, than what the Punisher dealt with last time. So like I said, that was uh, a really kind of standard, almost, I don't want to say cliche, um, but but nearing cliche kind of Italian uh, mob situation. And this is uh, this really closed off, almost impenetrable, nobody even knows it exists, a uh, sex slave operation where uh, there, there are these, it's this Euro European group that's a father-son duo and there's a woman who works for them. And it's uh, Tiberiu who is the uh, the older man, almost a gentleman, but I, I can't say that. Uh, these are all monsters in different forms and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then his son, Christu. And Tiberiu is the, is the soldier and he started the operation and uh, the way in, I guess I'll talk about this now. Um, th these are all like like heinous and and nearly inhuman in different ways. So this guy actually gets off on uh, hurting people and seeing these girls suffer. Uh, the the idea is they pick girls up off the street, or they wait until a horrible tragedy happens, and then they take. Uh, orphans, <clears throat> and they put them into, and they raise them in this sex, sex slave operation, and they decide that it's more lucrative to use people as property and to, uh, you know, sell them and let, and, and, and they don't actually sell the slaves, they keep them, uh, but they're, but it's a prostitution ring of the worst possible kind, uh, where it's not just a, like, like, pimp prostitute situation where you have girls that, uh, walk on the streets for money, uh, this is a situation where they kidnap them, they keep them locked up all the time, they rape them into submission, I don't know if that's a word that I can say without getting flagged in, in some way, but it's but it's the word. It's what happens in this, and I uh, there and it's it's just a constant hell all the time. And their business model is I uh, use girls uh, to get money because you can use them over and over again. Uh, unlike something like cocaine, where you sell it one time and then you have to go and get more. And so, uh, like I said, you have the older guy who's probably in his 70s, Tiberiu. He's a loose cannon. He's become a liability for the whole operation. He doesn't care about the business. He is uh, completely emotionally driven. He was a soldier and he sees himself always constantly at war. And war either changed him to where, and we don't, we don't know for sure because we don't see a lot of background about what he was like when he, he was younger, but I think he had to have either changed to love violence and uh, that like that's the only way he can get his kicks now, or he was that way in the first place and war exacerbated it. I'm not sure. His son is uh, cold, calculating, uh, does not care what happens to uh, the people that he has to make suffer for the sake of his business. And he's a monster because he doesn't have any compassion and uh, he leaves emotion completely out of it. And he's, and, and uh, as long as he's making money, he doesn't care what he has to do. And then they have uh, this woman who works for them that kind of makes the whole operation happen uh, and runs the slave girls. And her name is Vera. And she is this horrifying cross between them. But she, like, gets the business side of it and is kind of um, more on 
Christu's side than she is to Beerio, to the point where when Christu decides that his father has become too much of a liability, she's actually going to help him try to murder his father. Um, you have uh, you, you have kind of a family business intrigue in the middle of all of this. Uh, but, so, so she's like the business side and the soldier side all at the same time. Interestingly, uh, I think we see kind of a mirror in the Punisher for these people as well, where the Punisher is kind of both of those things too, but obviously he's more human in that, uh, when he finds a slave girl who has, um, escaped, or I guess he helps her escape, uh, and th this is unlike the Punisher. He doesn't usually rescue people, uh, but she says something about their uh, killing her baby, and that bothers him, and so he takes her back to his apartment, and he makes a little bit of an exception, although he does continue to operate the way the Punisher always does, in that, and this is a lot of what this arc is about, he's all about uh, punishing the the bad guys as he finds them more than he's about trying to actually solve problems and make the world any more of a better place. Uh, and so, you know, I've always seen the Punisher as like the bat is like Batman gone, you know, two or three steps over his line. And so in that way, I see him as kind of uh, like, like Vera with a conscience or, um, or at least where the business is different, right? Where, like, he is emotionally driven to a point uh, because it all starts from what happened to his family, but he also is all business, and it's not about money, but he's he's about business in the sense that at the end of the day, he's not really interested in, like I said, trying to... Uh, fix the issues that create these people. He's not trying to change hearts and minds. Uh, he doesn't have exactly quotas, but I mean, he's just going to move on to the next person that needs to be killed, and that is his business. And in that way, he's also kind of business. And so, the Punisher is obviously uh, a a scary character, and he it's hard to condone the things that he does. But what this arc uh, is, the the heart of this arc is. This is a place where it is very difficult not to kind of condone the way the Punisher operates. Uh, there's even a social worker here who feels that way, and or, or who, who begins to feel that way. Uh, it goes too far for her. When we get to the end, she is still trying to stop the sex slave ring. She, or, or just like sex slave rings in general, that's kind of her whole MO. Uh, that's everything she's about. She will not go to the Punisher again because uh, he took things so far in this and murdered. Uh, you know, he finally does manage to get into this what seems like an impenetrable fortress, and he just some of the most gruesome, you know, you know, horrifying images uh, I've seen for Punisher kills, and that's by design. That's on purpose. Uh, Garth Ennis did an interview. Uh, after this, where he said that uh, this was one of the only things he could think of where he really couldn't help but, uh, you know, buy into the Punisher's um, uh, the Punisher's methods. What happens to these girls is is really hard to talk about. It's just unspeakable, and it's pretty clear that Ennis did his research. And I think some of the things, some of the uh, stories that we get in this about what happens to some of these girls, uh, he probably got from real news, or he he changed some details or made up something really close to some of them. Uh, but there's there's a story about uh, like like a, a Greek Orthodox girl who is raped like 88 times on Christmas Day, and then she feels like she's unworthy to go to church again after that. Um, I won't talk about too many more of them, but it was it was gut wrenching, and it it made me look real deep inside myself and say, what kind of world am I really living in versus the kind of world that I see on an everyday basis? And that, and, and like, what kinds of things am I ignoring so that I can get through my day? 
it made I'm not gonna say it made me want to be the Punisher. It didn't make me want to go out and murder everyone who does these things. Although, again, hard not to go. Yeah, okay, Punisher. I'm gonna give you a pass this time. These people really did deserve that. Um, there's a there's a cop toward the beginning of this that says that. You know, with with all of the people that Punisher has killed, like I, I think the number in this is like two thousand at this point. Um, you can barely consider uh, most of those people, you know, actually human. And I, I, I don't know. Like, like it, it, it makes you rethink things. Um, there. So, so the social worker in this, uh, her name is Jennifer Cook. She's established, I think, in a, in in an earlier story. Uh, but I didn't know about her. Um, she talks about... So she gives a lecture uh, when we're introduced to her. And she talks about how uh, she has to like water down and censor the stories that she tells to people uh, about what happens to these girls in order to get them to even listen to her in the first place. That, like, it's hard to shake people out of apathy. It's hard to get people to uh, really even believe that this stuff is going on because, again, they're not seeing it... Um, on a daily basis and it's not you know it's not in their purview and it doesn't fit in their like neat orderly sense of how the world works and it's a catch-22 because people kind of need that in order to not go insane but at the same time if we all just let these awful things happen they just keep on happening and so you know you don't want to shut down uh, over these things and not live your life, but at the same time, uh, if we just, if, if this like doesn't fit into our worldview and our sense of the world, and we just let it keep happening, what does that say about us as, as, as individuals and as a society? Um, I, I thought it was really telling when she goes on about uh, how she has to leave out a lot of details um, for 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 people to even pay attention in the first place, and I uh, it's you know we talk a lot in this about um, and and we see we see examples of it uh, throughout the story and major major parts of the plot, um, all the different things that get in the way of solving this problem. Uh, you have social workers who are ineffectual and who uh, you know no one's listening to, but also who. I uh, like simultaneously like like Jennifer have a lot of information but still don't understand the culture and don't realize how easy it is to make it worse when you start trying to unravel that tapestry and so the uh this is one of the things that hit me hardest with this I uh, the woman that Punisher saves at the beginning hates this social worker because she blames this Jennifer this woman for getting her baby killed I uh, I haven't even talked about her background. It's horrifying. I don't know how much of that I even want to talk. I, I even want to mention. Um, she was uh, put into the slave ring at a young age, like fifteen, uh, and again raped into submission to, um, you know, force her to just submit and do what she's told, and then. Uh, she has a quota of a certain number of men that are paying to be with her that think that she's just a regular prostitute and being paid and there because she wants to be, but they, unbeknownst to them, are actually also raping her. And uh, long story short, she ends up giving birth and they use the baby as leverage over her to get her to continue to, um, uh, to deliver um, poor choice of words dealing with a baby, I guess, but, but but to continue, you know, you know, doing her job, what what she's told to do as the sex slave. And then uh, eventually she finds out about the social worker and uh, really now has more motivation to try to get out of this life. And so uh, she gets a hold of this of Jennifer, of the social worker. And um, one thing leads to another, and the woman, uh, you know, digs too deep and kind of unruffles the wrong feathers, and uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the slave girl is found out, and the baby is killed. And so, you know, again, it's 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 easy for 
uh, a person in that position to not fully understand the situation uh, and you know how easy it is to get someone hurt or killed then you have uh, cops who might like like the duo that we have in in this book um, we have uh, officer Russ Parker and Marcy Miller who uh, are doing everything they can to try to bring down this group, but they have their hands tied behind their backs in in various ways, uh, and so they end up working with the Punisher because, of course, uh, they, there's too much bureaucracy, and also they're having to, you know, red tape and stuff, uh, but then also you have people on the take who might be working for a group like this so that they have you know an ear on the ground uh in the police department and uh so we have a guy here uh weston who is that guy and of course you know that makes it impossible to bring down a group like this and then you have a vigilante like the punisher who's not actually there to solve the problem and you put all of this together and i can't help but throw my hands in the air and go how does this ever stop uh you take down this one group and there are still lots more out there. And uh, Ennis is uh, really persuasive in, uh, in in making you think that this is uh, a much worse problem than anybody realizes and that uh, because it's so unspeakable, people aren't talking about it. And uh, it is... And one of the things that really stuck with me is he talks about how it's part of the... It's like an integral part of the economy of some third world countries. And so uh, if you take the uh, you know sex slave operations out of those countries, just like drug trades, their economies collapse. And I forget which country, but there's one, and I bet this is just a real statistic. I didn't look it up. Even if it's not, uh, it's very effective in the fiction. And I'm sure stuff like this happens. Um... It said that in in a, in a certain country, 90% of girls don't even go to public school because they're afraid they're going to get kidnapped and thrown into one of these you know sex slave rings. And uh, I forget what character says it, but um, and I mean th this this is Ennis just kind of talking on the page, but it it's again it's pretty character driven, and it and I buy it as a thing that. Um, one of the, who is this? I, th I think it was the social worker, Jennifer, but I like, like I, I bought it in the moment as a thing that that character would say. Um, but she talks about how uh, if, you know, if uh, so much of a country's uh, like, like national profit comes from this kind of thing, then uh, it, it is d bereft at that point and is, you know, at a point of no return. And, like, what do you do if people just, you know, are too scared to even leave their homes? Uh, and nobody's doing anything to stop this because because they need it. Uh, the story also is a lot about the fine line between bigotry and um, seeing people that are different from you as less than human or as inhuman uh, and how easy it might be to step over that line that like we all have the potential for that kind of darkness in us and we can start from a place of um, just you know making fun of people for for being different than us and for and you know seeing someone as kind of lesser uh, to using that as a convenient excuse to take advantage of those people uh, to to the point of, you know, like using them like slaves, like, like in this. Uh, Pascal has a speech in this where he talks about rule of the strongest, and he takes Vera and uh, in in this and, and it's it's a really brilliantly written scene, uh, but it's it's extremely tense and really really hard to get through. He's got her in his office. I think this is that scene. Uh, maybe he says this to Tabiru, but I think I, I think it's her because he kills each of these people one by one. Uh, and by the way, like really believable and creative and crafty ways. Uh, like like we have a um, super. Uh, resourceful Punisher here. Uh, at the beginning of the story, like I said, uh, Christu is not getting along with his father and wants him to get less involved because he's just killing people because he wants to. 
and Christie's trying to run a business and that's making it difficult. And I, for a second, was thinking that it might be too convenient that he's talking about killing his father at the same time as the Punisher ends up getting wind of this and is going to take this whole thing down. But that ends up having a lot to do with why Christie finally decides to um, pull the trigger, so to speak, uh, because he's already thinking it. I uh, in the back of his mind, and I think he's talking about it to Vera a little bit. We're like, I think I, I I'm I'm going to have to kill my father. But if Punisher didn't get involved, I don't know if that would happen because uh, I suddenly his father Tiberiu wants to go after the Punisher, and he's and, and Christie's like, you're insane. That's nuts. Nobody's ever been able to kill the Punisher. Obviously, why would we do that? We could just you know leave him alone. And uh, they, they they like they move houses and they lose a lot of money, but they set up a different operation, and like the Punisher would never find them except this guy just wants to be a badass and that's why he finally decides to try to kill his father and then uh, Punisher uses that to his advantage where he's able to uh, set up traps and kill each of these guys uh, while they're um, going after each other and so it, it all ends up seeming uh, like like really believable and a really t again tightly woven narrative um but anyway, so you get the, uh, that scene in the office with Vera. He says, um, you know, I guess it's okay for me to do this to you because I am stronger than you and that's all that matters, right? Like, uh, you know, whoever has power over someone else, that makes them the person and and someone else the property. Uh, and is basically what he's saying. Uh, and that hit me really hard. Um... Chewbacca's lover mentioned that uh, this is a thing that a lot of Punisher fans have wanted to see taken to screen in some capacity. That it should either be a movie or one of, or or, or it should have been a season of the Netflix Punisher show. And he said he wasn't sure if that was a good idea. He said he couldn't quite see it, and he told me that uh, he didn't think that with uh, this sensitive of a, of a subject matter, it would ever go to screen. And I tend to agree with that to some degree. I don't think uh, it would have ever been translated like straight off the page because, of course, this is this is super gruesome. It's it's super haunting. Uh, I I think for some of the same reasons that the social worker is afraid to tell people too much that that uh, you know she'll freak them out and they won't try to help. Um, a movie studio uh, or a TV network might be afraid to you know put some of these ideas on screen. Um, but just as a as a narrative, um, I think it would make for a better film than it would a, a uh, TV show. I can a season. Um, I can totally see why people want this because uh, it really gets to the heart of who the Punisher is and why he does what he, what he does in a different way than I have seen before. There's some discussion here about how difficult it is for a lot of men to uh, see this from the female victim's perspective and to see how it could happen to them without them bringing it on themselves. Like, surely uh, they either want it to some degree or they uh, did something to make it happen to themselves. And... That is, of course, a major stigma, and that could have been laid on too thick, and I think, like, just men in general could have been thrown too much under the bus with this. Uh, Ennis doesn't make anybody and any particular kind of person more of a hero or less vilified than anybody else except, of course, just the victims that this happens to. Nobody is perfect in this, and the people who are 100% evil and despicable are all in this uh, one group uh, this this the sex slave ring, ring that they that they've set up, and I fully believe that people like this really do exist. Uh, everybody else is really well rounded and complex, and I guess to some degree some of those people are too. I just don't know a lot about where exactly they come from. We're distanced from them. I don't think that's a problem. I'm not really complaining about that. They're not supposed to be sympathetic. And uh, they're they're supposed to be monsters, and the point is that these people really do exist. Um, and so, but the reason I bring that up is to say that uh, Punisher, to some degree, actually is 
able to appreciate uh, this this woman's plight. Uh, we don't get into his head and uh, like relate it all to his family, but I'm sure. But there is a lot of talk in this about you know the social worker would say like you know imagine as difficult as this is for you to believe you know that it's happening imagine it was your daughter imagine it was your wife and i'm sure that that's what frank castle was doing um the people who are fighting back against this the most are women understandably because it's easier for them to put themselves in the shoes of these victims and it's not like uh, most of the men in this don't care in fact i think it's interesting that um th between the two cops uh the the duo in this that we follow uh it's the uh it's the guy who uh who who insists on pushing this a lot further than his female partner and then by the end of it uh she ends up continuing that fight at, uh, with the social worker where she uh leaves her um she she stops being a cop she leaves the force and uh becomes a social worker along with Jennifer but it is difficult to fully appreciate what happens to these women and it is a lot easier to uh you know just live your life and uh pretend like these things don't happen or uh you, you know kind of an ignorance is bliss sort of situation um i i a part of me wants to see would like to see this adapted just because i think it's uh an important story i think more people need to read about this kind of thing i think we need more awareness of it uh but i also would love to see a thing like this not just play as a preachy psa and uh actually be you, you know as good of a story as this is uh that first issue establishes every major idea and most of the major players uh deftly in 20 pages and uh it, it also has these really great hooks and these wonderful cliffhangers where you get to the end of that first issue and uh the punisher in his internal monologue is saying uh is, is uh, talking about all of the things that the victim that he just rescued is about to tell him but doesn't give you all the details yet so you have to read the next issue to find out about all of that so i mean it really reads like ennis has gotten a lot of this figured out and knows where it's all going uh before th that that first issue and so it's just a master class in organization and structure i love that last page of that first issue uh where, where he's like and then she told me about the baby uh and and she told me about the thing that i uh, the that vera said and uh you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you start to get that exposition at the beginning of the next issue and you're curious to find out what those things are and it all sounds uh like like horrifying but it's so vague uh that you have to know and then once you find out you kind of wish that you didn't know and uh it's it's brilliant storytelling one of the things that would make this difficult uh to do in the netflix show would just be uh the way that that uh the bad cop tries to uh take down the punisher because the idea is uh chris Thu calls him up that is remember the the businessman uh in the sex slave ring and he says uh we have to find a way to take down the punisher he's getting into our business and he's going to wreck everything and so i uh, this guy weston uh, this bad cop he has this brilliant idea to i uh, try to make it look like punisher beat up our uh, good guy cop duo uh and he didn't he, he hardly laid a finger on them and, but they showed up when he rescued the the uh the slave girl at the beginning and they're going to pretend like uh he brutalized them in order to uh make it uh like open season on the punisher so that uh the cops will go after him and the force uh, actually mostly kind of likes the punisher being around even if they don't totally 
uh, condone his activities because he's solving a lot of problems for them, of course. And so the angle is now the Punisher is a problem. Uh, we should never have let him operate. Now he's he's crossed a line. He's gone insane. He's taking down bad cops. Or he's, he's pardon me, he's just taking down cops. And of course, uh, Weston pretends like uh, he he wants to do this to further his career, but it's actually because he's in the pocket of the bad guys. And that's a really cool idea. It's a neat, uh, it's not even a frame-up job, um, but it's a, uh, it's, it's a cool angle on that. Uh, but the problem is, in the Netflix Punisher show, uh, I don't think... If, I haven't watched that in a while, but if memory serves, uh, I don't think that police departments were, you know, as okay with the Punisher's activities. And it seems like when he's on the run, like like if somebody if somebody finds him, uh, you, you know, that's that's much more of a huge problem than it might be here. Uh, so I don't know if you could fit that aspect of it into this as easily. And I also just see this as a really good three-act movie. I, I feel like if you tried to stretch this to eight episodes, or, you, you know, eight, ten episodes, it might be a little bit too much. You might have to throw some subplots in. I think this is better as a simpler and more minimal piece. I don't know if you could get people to, you know, hang on with you for eight or ten straight episodes of this uh, as you know, you know, dark and relentless and depressing as that would be. And that is the point, right? Like, we should not be comfortable uh, with this subject matter. And those, uh, the couple seasons of The Punisher that we have uh, are already pretty heavy and deal with some, uh, you know, rough subject matter and are very, very gritty things. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe you could get away with this. Um, I don't even know that it has to be a Punisher story. Uh, and and I, like, I really like it as a Punisher story, but I would love to see something like this turned into a film, even if it's not Frank Castle. Uh, I don't think it would be a good like opening film for Frank Castle. Like, if you were to do... And again, I think it should be a movie if you were to adapt it, but uh, I, like, like I, it's, it's such a... I don't think you could sell it as a comic book thing. I, you certainly wouldn't want to do that. And this is not, you know, in a world of superheroes in the first place. This is a much more grounded, realistic kind of world. I would think that if you did this in a Punisher movie, you'd want it to be your second or third movie. I, I would think you'd want to, to establish this character first. Or do like a Punisher Max franchise where it's this character, but it's not anything like a comic book world. And it would be pretty niche. I think you'd want to do it on a really small budget. I don't think you would want to make it anything like a blockbuster. You you wouldn't want to expect that a lot of people would even go out of their way to see it. Um, but I do think uh, it, it could be a brilliant movie. Uh, I, I think something like this should probably be made. Um, real quick, the only... Uh, real criticisms I have about this, uh, and really nothing as far as the content of the story... Um, I realized reading this arc that it's a little bit strange that we never do sound effects in this book at all. We don't do the automatopoeia thing whatsoever. Uh, it's almost like uh, Ennis is avoiding that because he thinks it's too corny and too comic booky, and I don't know that I would agree with that. Um, it reads like storyboards almost to a fault. Like, it's extremely cinematic, it, it's extremely foreboding and atmospheric. Uh, I love the shadow work, I love uh, a lot of the lighting choices. It's an extremely filmic experience, and that's part of the reason that I would like to see this as a movie, because I feel like uh, it, it's almost not complete. Like, it's, I mean, it, it, it is complete, it's a wonderful piece all on its own, but what I mean is, it it does kind of feel like it wishes it was a movie. In in having to be a comic book, there are places where it's weird that sound is missing. Like it's not just a like like it's just a visual medium, and there are places like where a phone will ring and a person will just pick up the phone and start talking, but you didn't actually hear it ring. So it does feel a little bit weird because you're missing like a whole aspect of it. That's the reason we do the the, the uh, you know sound effects words uh, in comics. I think really subtle ones would be fine, and I kind of wish they were still there. I also think that you need establishing shots between pages. I'm glad that this story, and, and this book in general, 
doesn't do the thing that a lot of comics do. Uh, and these days it happens constantly. It drives me crazy. Like in modern comics, you're always seeing uh, like the last thing that a person said on the top of the next page. And I've read comics where it happens every time there's a scene change that goes over a, a page. And uh, it, 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 it's just irritating because you know that the scene isn't quite finished and then you turn the page and you're already establishing the next scene, but you're reading uh, like a punchy line of dialogue from the last one. I'm glad this doesn't do that, but it is jarring to turn the page and we're just smack dab in the middle of another scene. And sometimes it feels like a scene that's kind of started already where like it has nothing to do with, you, with, with what you just saw. It's moving to another character. Just give me an establishing shot of a building or something at the top of the page. I don't know why this book doesn't do that. But anyway, that's about um, all of my issues with it. This is, like I said, uh, haunting. It's terrifying. Uh, the last image that you're left with is absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, with the, the woman who Punisher rescues at the beginning uh, goes on and is able to, to finally live a life. And it, it says, you, you know, with what life they left her. Uh, and she is a waitress. And she sees a family with with babies, and she like just can't contain herself. And uh, it's it's a uh, it's just really sad. Uh, th th this whole thing uh, there, there's there's such a weight um, to the subject matter with this, where like it takes it really seriously, and it's not gratuitous about the violence. It's incredibly brutal. It's incredibly rough. There are panels that are difficult. To look at for any amount of time. Punisher has the most hideous kill I've seen in maybe anything in this, or at least it, it's up there. Um, when he kills Tiberio, not Tiberio, Christu, uh, he takes his innards and he unravels them and he uh, and, and he like strings them up on trees and stuff. And I'm like, God, that's disgusting and awful. And I'm sure that there's somebody reading this book who's uh, not appreciating it for the same reasons that I am, going, yeah, that's cool, Punisher's being all brutal and and uh, disgusting. Uh, but that guy deserved that. Uh, like, and, and it's, you know, it's a violation. He's ripping up his insides. Like, like, like there's a real clear kind of poetic justice thing going on there. Something else I wanted to mention real quick, too, is there are um, a couple of really neat, nuanced, uh, like, visual metaphors in this that I noticed. Uh, there's one part, and it took me a minute to decide what I what I thought this was about, uh, but there's this, there's this bit where when Punisher is killing Vera, I uh, remember that woman that, uh, like, like, takes care of the slaves, um, but doesn't actually take care of them. She gets in their heads and plays mind games, and, and, and she's awful. Um, he he starts by uh, kicking her up against glass. Uh, she's she's in like a high rise office building, and uh, he he keeps talking about how the glass isn't going to straight up break, and he says that I uh, you you can't. You know, you could you could hit it like a hundred times, and you wouldn't totally break it. But he says uh, that you can, like, I can't remember how exactly he puts it. You can damage the frame, or uh, basically what he's saying is that you can, uh, you know, start to affect the foundation. And I think that's supposed to be a metaphor for. Uh, and and I think it's it's unintentional on Punisher's part. Like I don't think he appreciates the subtext of that. Uh, that you can't easily solve this problem, get rid of the slave trade, and all of that. Uh, but you can start to weaken it uh, if only we would care to do anything about it. And then the question is, how far do you go? And is uh, the, the terrifying way that the Punisher handles it the right way to handle it when uh, nobody's paying attention to it. Um, it just the, it just really makes you think. Uh, something else I meant to mention too is it seems like it, it seems like later, like by about 2010 or so, um, 
like slave trade becomes a really quick easy go-to for things bad guys are doing that a hero will will come in and fight them about to like open a piece i feel like i saw that like a million times especially in marvel where just everything was uh human trafficking and we wouldn't actually be saying anything about human trafficking we're just like we need something that bad guys are doing that isn't just drugs again so it's that and i got really tired of seeing it and now i've read something that is about the you know horrific behind the scenes happening with the slave trade and uh, i'm not saying that it you know that makes me suddenly go okay i guess i'm glad that we constantly you know fell back on that over and over again um it became almost a cliche and i don't like that that was a cliche um, but it made me think about it differently, and it made me glad to read something that was actually really about that. Anyway, I've been talking about this forever. Uh, if you have read this arc, leave your comments, let me know how you feel about it, tell me if you think that it, this is a good thing to adapt. The more I'm thinking about it, uh, it is, I think, a movie that I would like to see. This is my last point, this is the thing I meant to say earlier. I think this is the right kind of cynical fiction. I uh, so, sometimes when I'll call something cynical, uh, I'll get a comment where someone will say, "Okay, so you just want everything to be wholesome and you know, like no stories are ever ever bleak. Like there's a reason to tell bleak stories." Oh yes, absolutely. I think there's a difference maybe between a cynical story and a story told cynically. What I mean is a story that uh, is kind of emotionally manipulative and doesn't want you to think that it's cynical. It's not that it's about a cynical subject matter or uh, it's saying that uh, sometimes it feels like there's no hope or there's, I don't know what the answer to a question like this is and maybe there isn't one and that is inherently cynical. That is thoughtful cynicism. Uh, it, it, like, like, this is cynical in the sense that it's saying... Um, again, I don't know what the answer is. This feels hopeless, and it feels like Punisher is doing the only thing you can do about it, and uh, there's a there's a part of me that is almost even okay with him handling it the way he's handling it. I mean, I don't know what to call that but cynical, but it's the right kind of cynical. I don't think the piece itself is a cynical piece. I think it's telling a cynical story, um, if, if you at all appreciate the... Um, the, the difference that I'm making there. Uh, but anyway, thanks again for watching, folks. Really appreciate it. I, I want to thank Chewbacca's Lover once again for having me review this. If there's something you'd like me to look at, uh, if you want to do a uh, You Made Me Watch or You Made Me Read, a requested off-the-cuff review like this, you can go to patreon.com slash geekvolution and join the $15 tier. If you want to stay at that tier, it will uh, keep you in the rotation. And right now we have... 15, 16 people there, and so uh, it's hard to get to things um, more quickly than every three to four months. But if you, uh, but if you join it just for one month, uh, you will still get your review. It, it will go in the list, and I'll get to it when it gets to your turn. Anyway, thanks again, folks. Really appreciate you, and I'll see you again next time. I'm Captain Logan, and happy reading.